Coming back to Eliza's point about progressive enhancement, do you think we need better standards for print? I'm thinking in terms of, so the Guardian have this approach where they load the core of the page, then they wait for DOM content loading to load the enhancement, so they can't touch handles, etc., and then they have leftovers, but they do that all through JavaScript. Now that means it's hidden from the preload, effectively, so the browser, you know, the browser's limited to what it's doing. Do you think we need better standards for, for techniques like that, and <coughs> what sort of things do you think we could do? Oh, can I have some time to prepare for this question? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I concur that the landscape is a bit chaotic. Um, a few years ago, I felt much grimmer about it because I felt that our over-reliance on JavaScript at the time was kind of dangerous. Uh, things have changed since then, and you know, it, in that case, we're doing better. I don't actually have a great answer for that. I think that's a really interesting question that I've never really thought about before, and in that, in that perspective that you have on it. Does anyone have any? Yeah, I, mean, I think to me, the, it, it's, it's about specific action. So I think progressive enhancement as a concept is something that I don't know if you can standardize progressive enhancement, period. That's a, it's a concept. Um, but I think there are specific subsets of how you do progressive enhancements that, um, that should, and some of them are, being, uh, being enhanced. Uh, I mean, a, probably a good example of that is the uh, latest uh, resource priority spec out of the W3C uh, Web Performance Group, uh, which allows you to mark resources as lazy load. Uh, I liked it better when it supported both lazy load and postponed for two different types of uh, <laughs> uh, resource communications. But right now, it would, uh, one of them got chucked. So this would be lazy load, and it would mark resources that are less important and leave it up to the user agent, up to the, the browser, to decide uh, when to download those components. So you know, it's one form. It was kind of sort of meant to replace some JavaScript image loaders and some async beacons and things like that. Um, so that one specifically actually tried to be kind of uh, somewhat generic and in my opinion to a certain, in various use cases, missed the spot and I can see people keep using uh, JavaScript because it's not there, but it's one attempt at it. There was a conversation about an image defer attribute. So those things are being standardized. Um, I do think that it, it's probably worthwhile to sort of you know, grab a bunch of standard people and sit down and think about progressive enhancement as a concept and translate that uh, into components because I think right now the conversation has been driven more by, by like individual features and you know, browser vendors being annoyed that people are hiding stuff from them with JavaScript. Uh, but you know, it's probably worth down to sit down and think about the use case from the top. I've had a moment to think about it and I actually have <laughs> a little bit further thought on this. So I had a brainstorm. As I think part of the inherent nature of progressive enhancement is that we're looking, um, we're asking questions about support for features in browsers. And by that very nature, it's likely that the kinds of questions we're asking are about things that haven't reached standardization across the full spectrum yet. And that may always be the case for progressive enhancement because we're, in a lot of cases, Future asking, yeah. exactly, we're asking questions about those things that are cutting edge or things that um, we think certain browsers don't do. So at, those things get pushed into standards, but it's going to take a while. So I think the progressive enhancement questions that we ask are potentially going to always be in that sort of limbo space a little bit. I do think so. In one of the edge cons, I think the one in, in London last time, one of the questions that was discussed was, uh, are, we building, uh, are, are we building today tomorrow's legacy browsers? I mean, the, the, the answer to that has to be yes. I mean, Know, in a year's time, two years' time, today's browsers would be legacy. And what are we doing to uh, keep ourselves you know, away from trouble uh, in some of those cases? And some answers are the six-week update cycles of Chrome and Firefox and things around auto update. But you know, I think probably sitting down and doing, well, future compatibility is, uh, is impossible. I mean, it's future. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there are still software architectures, uh, methodologies, and best practices that can kind of help mitigate the damage uh, and, and set us up for our success. So. I think that's magic. Like, Andy, what about a gang of four progressive patterns? Like, it's, it's the patterns for how we code our apps so that they will work in these. I think that it starts standard. bridging between technical and design thinking. When you, and it's, it's very essential thinking, but it's one of those, you, you get to a point where it's kind of hard to answer the question directly in terms of here's A, B, C, and D step that you take to follow a progressive road in the way that you should follow it because it, it's one of those vague and almost artistic spaces, and it's not a binary thing. 
Um, it's not like you're, you're flipping one switch to make a, a site behave in one way for one user and not in another. It's a complex, chaotic arrangement of a whole lot of stuff, and it takes a special kind of mind, <laughs> for sure. And patience. I think uh, Liza touched earlier on also about the ability to identify uh, or, or on how the fact that you can even find out which browser you're in is already a luxury by itself. Um, there was a talk in Mobilism last year on, uh, about consoles. I forget who gave it. Uh, um, and it was talking about consoles and the nightmare that they are and just how, how so often it is that you have no idea. Even if you're completely you know, fully informed, you just have no way to reach that. There was a similar conversation about the iPad mini uh, when it came out with you know, everybody frustrated that you can't figure out you're on an iPad mini and not an iPad. Um, yeah. So sometimes it's also it's just about the reach. But no, but I like the notion of saying define these as design patterns. Go back to software concepts of design patterns uh, uh, and and kind of core best practices. And in some cases, you can skip over the implementation details if the concepts are well established. I mean, I consider in my own practice, I generally consider differentiation for different kinds of devices its own kind of progressive enhancement. So you start from a baseline, you're actually progressing out to your differentiated devices. I think that one thing that Guy just touched, touched on too is that we really need to empower designers to be working on this stuff and thinking about this stuff. Um, it helps that I'm, I'm going to plug my book. I'm writing a book about this uh, called Design for, for Performance. But I think that a lot of these, the stuff that we end up deciding on um, and making hard decisions about starts at the design stage and not the development stage. But we so often throw performance problems over the wall at engineers. And really, if we can empower designers to be thinking about this stuff and understand the consequences of, of what they're choosing in terms of layout and function and, and all that stuff. Um, we could have a much a much happier place for progressive enhancement. Definitely. Sorry, you, you just mentioned something about throwing performance over the wall to engineers. Um, and I wonder, during your optimization phase, when you're, you're designing and building that app and those to be to the best it can be for the lowest common denominator and all that, how much does it how much do you factor in kind of the impact of thousands of users doing the same thing rather than just the one in your head? That's an interesting question. So I think that, um, so as the performance team, my, it's my team's job to help support these, these folks as they're, as they're thinking these things through. Um, and so we want to help them think about not just the desktops and mobile, but also performance stuff. I'm not sure how to answer that, because we're, we're not just talking about one, one use case, right? We're talking about a myriad of use cases anyway. So I think it's probably on us to help empower them to think, to think about like all of the users, or at least our target users, too. No, but I mean, sorry, more, uh, maybe I misread. Performance for one user, is it the same when you have a thousand users on the system doing different things at different times? I mean, how do you, how do you factor that into your optimization? Yeah, that's, that's real hard. I think that also touches a little bit on, the, on like the operational cost, too. Like, if I spend all my time fixing an infrastructure thing that helps 1% of our users, is that really where I want to spend my time as well? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's a solved problem. Right. Optimal, yeah, it's a little, little utilitarian, you know. Yeah, at the end of the day, like you have to lowest common denominator stuff is, I think, where you're getting at a little bit. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I'm sure. Like it sounded to me like you're asking more about load testing and performance as part of, of just a sequence happens uh, happening in concurrently. Is that the question? Sort of. In, in that we know that it's a step that needs to be done, right, for capacity planning and yeah. stuff. But I feel like it should factor into the, the optimization as well. Because we were talking about like speedy and using different techniques to, to optimize the app itself, well, that, that app is supported by servers that themselves have constraints like the devices that the, the users are holding. Yep. Right? So it's all, it's all connected. Yeah, I agree. And actually, there's that interesting anecdote is that many times those servers are now, uh, like the fanciest servers are actually starting to be built with ARM chips and the, <laughs> the same CPU chips that uh, might be on those mobile devices, just you know, without the screen and many more of them. Uh, but the, so yeah, well, I think capacity, in general, capacity management scale, uh, the ability to withstand high loads and, and be efficient through it is, is a core component. It, it is necessary. I think it touches a little bit on the question earlier on on... Um, uh, on whether there's an increase in capacity and your need for provisioning uh, because of the world of mobile. I mean, I think it, to a certain extent it goes beyond mobile. In mobile, maybe the interactions are a little bit different. You need to make sure that what you're simulating around load and around performance matches the use cases of their actual users uh, in those interactions. I think oftentimes the pattern in which your systems are accessed um, are, at least in, you know, in a system that doesn't have glitches, are not quite as deeply impacted by 
uh, the interaction models and, uh, and those paths. If your system is designed to be more service-oriented, more API-driven, uh, then at the end of the day, to perform a certain amount of action, a certain action, you're going to need a certain sequence of API calls. Maybe there's also some, some uh, surround sound around you know, JavaScript and CSS that need to be downloaded and need to be kind of well set up to, to handle loads there. But I think if your system is designed to handle sequences of actions via APIs and you make sure that those get load tested and, get, and execute and complete in, a, in an efficient uh, manner, get cached as they should be, uh, et cetera, then I think a lot of your uh, provisioning needs, a lot of that stress uh, can, can be kind of managed from that perspective, right? If you know you need this much in order to deal with this much load of these sequences of API calls. And then beyond that, there's, it's almost a veneer, it's almost another layer of handling the, uh, the, the pure uh, presentation layer components. Of course, you need to scale those, but things like content delivery networks uh, can oftentimes um, kind of are a little bit more established ways to, to handle some of those loads. Uh, I will say, specifically on the world of CDN, is that sometimes uh, one mistake that I see often is that we move to these like super smart um, uh, systems that would deliver different content to different users, uh, and we uh, very quickly disregard the caching layers that we have in between, you know, in our CDNs or maybe even in our load balancers or our caching proxies in between. And if you did that, then you would probably fall flat in your face quickly enough. Um, so you need to make sure that whatever um, uh, situational type of methodology you have, you need to make sure that those get reflected in those caching layers that you have so that it, they would cache the content at least as well as they did before, uh, if not uh, later. But I think between the API and that components, I mean, that would be my advice to, uh, to handle capacity. Okay. This is more of a general wondering. Um, you as time passes by, device manufacturers are making better phones, uh, which means standards and better resolution videos or images. And I'm just wondering, uh, so is, across the industry, is there a standard where the network providers and the device manufacturers kind of have sort of an agreement to kind of keep up with each other? Or is it something like, you know, the network providers are always trying to catch up with ever improving their bandwidth or requirements? Things like that. Everyone's always trying to catch up with everyone, I think. Yeah. I don't think there's any synchronization. No. I, yeah. I think right now the device manufacturers are pushing for Retina images and uh, SSL, and the carriers, the network providers, are scared, like, you know, I don't want to use the word here, but, you know, they're, they're yeah. definitely <laughs> unhappy about the switch to SSL, uh, in part because it takes away their ability to downgrade those images. <laughs> uh, on the, uh, so I would say they're out of sync. Um, I, I, I think the needs are, are different. The communications are different. Each player tries to uh, um, uh, kind of serve their own needs and to kind of keep up with the, the other side of it. Right now, I think the, my impression is that the devices are advancing ahead of the network capacities. Um, so although network in general is growing by leaps and bounds, you know, we, when you look at image, images over the last year, you know, they've grown 30%. Uh, the number of images hasn't grown by much. I think it went from like 53 to 56 or something like that. But the byte size of them has grown by 30 or 40 percent. I mean, that's a dramatic increase. There's no way the, ne the network capacity has grown in a similar fashion during that time. Uh, I would attribute that specific stat more to retina images and the fact that all these displays uh, devices uh, have these high-end images and all of the uh, uh, websites are upgrading to try and tap into those visuals. Um, but yeah, but also user-generated content, visual-oriented design, which is a whole trend in the world of design. Um, so I think right now the networks are the ones trying to catch up. Oh, I have a question. Everybody's waiting for me to ask. Um, <laughs> so I thought it was moot, but maybe it's not. Uh, are we seeing the end of M M dot sites with uh, responsive web dot? Design? Oh, I, well, I, actually, I was going to ask. I have a list of questions that I was going to ask um, you guys. If you didn't have questions for us, no, no, no. I want to. I just want to throw it out to the audience. So, how many people here are uh, managing, owning, involved with an M dot site? Okay. And how many? And there's no right or wrong answer. Don't be embarrassed. Um, and how many people here are uh, work with a site that has been responsibly designed? And how many are serving the regular desktop, like the right, so basically the same pages to all devices? Wait, okay. I have another, so, and how many people have a mix of all of those? Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> there we go, okay. When you say M dot, do you mean adaptive or do you mean 
I, I mean, I mean a, a site that's uh, it's only sent to to smartphones. To confuse matters, are we talking about sites that absolutely don't have URL parity, or are we talking about serving different content? Because I actually think that's an important differentiator. Yeah. 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 Why don't you tell us? About <laughs> oh, I used to tell everyone about No, I, I am so weary of this argument because it's not really an argument, I don't think. I think everyone's on the same team, actually. It's just funny how it gets portrayed as sort of responsive versus uh, uh, MDOT. Um, I think that there are, and here's my pat response, I think that there are absolutely wonderful qualities about each and reasons you would do each and a mix of, especially in enterprise situations, I find that a mix of both is usually where you end up. Um, I, I mean, responsive has become far more viable in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, it didn't, it frankly didn't used to be when it was really young, a realistic solution for an enterprise site. Um, but I, I don't think that any, either of them should have a stigma. I, I do tend to like URL parity, um, wherein you can go to a single URL and get generally the same thing, um, especially in terms of sharing and emailing links. Um, it can be very problematic if you're sending an MDOT site to link to a desktop user. But Yeah, and, re and redirects are bad for performance. Right. So, yeah, definitely avoiding that. So at Etsy, we have the mixed experience. Um, for pages that have mobile templates, we sniff out user agent and then deliver a different, you know, HTML and CSS, et cetera, but it's the same URL. And then for other pages, we have a response web design. So our development teams are able and empowered to choose what experience is going to be better for that page, whether we want to deliver different optimized assets or whether we've optimized them and we can deliver a response web design. We kind of have a mix of these things and it's really, everybody's autonomous in this way. So, so why did you ask responsive but not adaptive? So responsive is all the same load to a, to a desktop being refactored for mobile and adaptive being predictive. As you I think the usual, or, so the usual definition, the one I use in my book while we're doing book plugs yeah. here, <laughs> um, <laughs> is that uh, it is, you know, M dot or different URLs, there's literally different URLs, and M dot, a T dot, a dub, 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 which serves a, a desktop or other experiences. Uh, uh, adaptive delivery being a single URL, but behind the scenes serving different HTML to every client. So, so still making the distinction, still categorizing every incoming client into group A or group B and serving a different HTML. And responsive being sending a content down that would adapt on the client side. Um, so I think those are generally, the, I don't know if everybody's sort of in agreement on the, uh, on the terms there. Especially adaptive is one that is not quite as widely uh, accepted or or, uh, or agreed on. Right. There's um, a lot of conversation about responsive and how to optimize that. But I think it kind of for a performance load, you're getting the online experience down to the mobile. Why not push adaptive, which is really not a design principle, it's a performance principle. So to me, I think the difference is between adaptive and and what's called REST, responsive plus server side component. Uh, so adaptive and uh, REST is, is the if responsive is all client side and uh, adaptive means you categorize every incoming client. REST is to me some somewhere in between. We say, I'm doing a responsive website. That website would adapt on the client side to every device, including devices that I've never thought about before, including devices uh, that are you know, a small enough portion of my site that I haven't actually bothered identifying them. So I have this. But if I just did everything client side, my performance would be horrible. So what I would do now is I would identify known clients, and I would optimize for them. Uh, now, for those clients, I do exactly the same as adaptive delivery. Uh, I would actually identify that client, and I would serve them a slightly tuned. Usually, in that case, it would be the, the same website, but with like slight modifications. But it's still, I'm serving a different HTML to that client uh, that, to make them perform better. Uh, and I think that's a good approach. The difference between REST and adaptive delivery, in my mind, is just about what is the, is the absolute aspect of it. REST is a performance optimization technique. Your site is responsive, and you're using the server-side component to optimize for those clients you've identified. Adaptive delivery means you categorize every single incoming client, and you always put them, and you're forced to kind of go down into, this is a smartphone, this is a tablet, this is that component. Even if those, the HTML still is a little bit flexible, uh, you're bucketing those. So to, and to me, REST, so, so what you described you're doing in Etsy, in, in my mind, is REST. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and I think that is the uh, uh, kind of our way out of this mess to a certain extent uh, uh, and, and the approach to, that I would advocate. The earlier talk this morning, the biggest uh, reason, but actually the session was that never do M dot, and the reason was the round trip cost for redirect, and I haven't heard that mentioned, so you, you mentioned it just very yeah. quietly. Yeah, I quietly dropped that. That it's terrible for performance, so don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Redirects, yeah, Redirects are yeah. not good. Please don't do them. 
save everybody. The interesting thing on the redirect thing is if you look at the mobile version of HTTP archive, roughly 50% of the sites in there redirect from this request. Save yourself the headaches, folks. <laughs> Don't use them. <laughs> So I think, um, I agree with that comment. I agree that everybody does redirects today, and I also agree that that's wrong. Uh, <laughs> and that, that oftentimes, uh, not that the fact is wrong, but it's, it's wrong that it's, they're doing it. Uh, and also there's application redirects aplenty alongside the mobile redirects. Um, I do think that, practically speaking today, because responsive design has sort of been adopted faster than the implementation best practices of it have been adopted, uh, uh, what happens today is that a mobile website with redirects is much more likely to be fast than uh, a responsive website without, um, because the redirect would be saved, but then you know, 17 other factors of over-downloading and over-complexity uh, would make that website fast. Um. But, yeah, but that's not to say that response web, des web design is inherently bad for performance. I always like to add on to, to this. It's just the way we're doing it is not great. We, we, fact, can, we can do it well. In fact, I wrote a book called Responsive yes. and Fast, and you can get a, <laughs> get a free copy of it uh, at the uh, Akamai or Riley tomorrow. It can be done. Yeah. So I think the redirects are an integral part of when you talk about uh, the global FIs, especially mainly used for the uh, disaster recovery scenarios, where a lot of, I've heard a lot of guys trying to implement this, they're having their F5s, uh, virtual F5s, um, right, uh, a request coming from a DNS directly to their virtual F5s, and depending on what country they are in, or wherever they have the disaster recovery uh, lab set up, they send it back. Uh, so this is one extra step yeah. of redirects. Well, there's, I, I don't think we're advocating uh, against using redirect as a whole. It's just about using redirect as a part of the natural flow of your app. Um, I mean, yes, of course, if your server is down, you should redirect to a different location <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, 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 get to, uh, to get to get to a secondary server. No yeah. doubt about that. Yeah, comparing uh, by the way, sometimes you can do that at your. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes you can do that at the load balancer instead of redirecting. Actually, just you know. Uh, 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 gracefully or silently go to that different location. Oftentimes people use the CDN to do that, like at Akamai, that's a very common occurrence. Um, so you can do those. It's not redirects as a whole, it's just redirects as a part of the core flow. I want to, yeah, similar for the HTTP, HTTPS, you're going to have to have a, a redirect in there. It's a bummer. Yeah. Have any of you tried mixing adaptive and responsive design? So like delivering something specific to a device, but then responding when that I think that's REST pretty much, right? It, yeah, or it, it moves into that space. I think maybe the one exception to that would be uh, things like what People Magazine did and things like that, which is launch a responsive mobile website. So basically say, mm -hmm. I'll still have a desktop site. That's actually a fairly common it, adoption methodology because you know, they, they, they got the mandate to rewrite their mobile website but not their desktop or they're just afraid of responsive and they're just trying to make it a, a gradual performance. But from what I've seen, those are just interim steps. So they're not, it's not that there are strategies to have this type of mixed thing, but just to learn responsive, they're going to make their mobile website responsive, and then they would proceed. Pam, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to go back to something that Liza said about the responsive web design and, and, and speed and the fact that it can be done. Like, it, it, it it, it really can. I, I did have really, like, no, in no way should this be called, like, a study, but I did some, a little bit of ad hoc um, uh, research a while back where I just randomly took 60 responsibly designed sites that um, made all these kind of best of lists, not fastest lists, but basically, like, they were on, you know, all these, like, kind of year-end lists, like, best responsive site of 2013, best responsive site so far in 2014. And I ran it through web page tests, and just, uh, I wasn't testing them on mobile. I wanted to just see how they perform on desktop, like, for a DSL connection uh, on Chrome. And of the 60 sites I tested, only 12 of them loaded in seven seconds or less. Like, and I'm, that, I'm talking about full, full load time. Um, and the thing that all those sites had in common and that all the rest of the sites didn't have in common was that all the sites that loaded in seven seconds or less were under one meg in size. So there's a, just a huge correlation. At the end of the day, it's super simplistic. Just like if you have your pay to server one meg, they're just not going to be fast on mobile. It's just not, and they're not even going to be fast on desktop, frankly. So just bearing that in mind, like, and when I looked at the the payload for the whole, you know, the entire list of 60 sites, I saw pages, you know, these are all responsive sites, like 
three, four, five megs in size. Like there was just no attention paid to, to anything performance related with regard to, to building these pages. And they looked great, like they all looked fantastic, but the sites that were fast looked just as good as the sites that weren't fast. So just kind of putting that out there. I think you, you hit it on the nail as well, talking about how there was no awareness to performance. Yeah. I think, you know, yes, you can make a responsive website fast. It's a little harder than making a non-responsive website, like a dedicated mobile website fast. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's definitely doable. But what happens more often than not is just it was never, never really considered. And, mm -hmm. you know, most of the conversations I have about that happens when the responsive website launched and then they realized how much <laughs> impact they've just caused, like how much pain. Uh, yeah. They've caused their mobile experience, you know, just after they pat each other on the shoulder and launching a response. <laughs> or their website. desktop experience. Right. Uh, yeah, right. Fair enough. Yeah, you're right. I'm kind of curious. Uh, have you, you must have come across like really bad redesigned sites and you know, the whole point of it. You must have checked box every one of those bad stuff. Can you, you know, list a few and. You know, sure. <laughs> Happy to. Yeah. I refuse to. I refuse <laughs> to cite brand names, but uh, I was. I was just randomly noticed a, a large, um, we'll call it a media uh, conglomerate site I was looking at last year, um, even, and, and I made sure to proxy it and actually test it's all of what it was happening on a mobile device. It was delivering among about, it was like a 10 meg payload on just the page, but it was also quietly in the background downloading a 27 megabyte video file that never got played on that page. So it's just, I, I find that amazing. This was like an enterprise level site, probably, you know, gets millions of visitors. And I, I, it, it, it boggles, it really does, it boggles. I guarantee they have a content uh, management system and tech isn't involved and they're downloading the content onto that page mm -hmm. and not monitoring. You run into these sites all the time. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, so to me, the HTTP archive, I'm actually doing this tomorrow in the third party performance talk. I've, you know, I, I use the HTTP archive oftentimes as a way to demonstrate an extreme version of a mistake. When I was uh, um, talking about domain charting and excessive domain charting, looked it up, found a website, um, some news website, I forget the website now, uh, name now, which used 10 domain charts. Wanted to find a website that has you know, many requests and don't do domain charting and should easily found a website called the World Domination Summit, uh, which is actually a bunch of hippies in, in Portland, in Portland. not at all a, a very TED-like type of event, despite the name. Uh, yeah, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but, yeah, it's a, it, but it's sort of a, like a TED. It's just the World Domination Summit sounds evil. Uh, um, and they, they had like 700 or so different requests that are all like being on the same domain. So it's pretty easy to use. I don't know if I've seen... Every website makes mistakes. Uh, some make more more than others, but usually I find I encounter them just when you're trying to find, you're trying to kind of uh, uh, make a point. 99.9% yep. um, .9 of these cases, it's not due to really kind of some core inability of the developers to write something well, but rather due to lack of uh, awareness. It's the fact that there was no single performance test run on these websites before they were launched. Yeah, and I see when we find, like, say something launches or is getting ready to launch and um, it's not performing well and we're, we're caught off guard by it on the performance team, what we find is that those developers just didn't know. Like, it's, it's pure ignorance. It's not ever malicious. It's just, like, they didn't realize what we're looking for. They didn't realize how to optimize it. So it's all about educating people and empowering people to make the right kinds of decisions. The good news is a lot of the steps to do basic optimization on this stuff are really easy. Yeah. Or really basic, if not easy. Maybe a little time-consuming, but not hard. Or automatable. Yeah, autom automatable. But your, but your point about like CMS is, is a good one because, I mean, CMS, is, it's not even devs who are using them. It's like, and the, uh, um, I used to work for someone who, his, he had a really funny quote. It was kind of a playing on, like, the guns don't kill people, people kill people. CMSs don't slow down pages, but people who use CMSs slow down pages. <laughs> so um, realizing that, like, the outreach and education around performance really has to spread out throughout. If you have an organization where everyone's a publisher, theoretically, like, you know, just what's the what's even the awareness of, of performance? And when people are just like, I mean, I've worked with some pretty Byzantine CMSs where, <laughs> like, I don't even know who designed them. And you know, some I can I can sympathize with people who have to use them, and they're just trying to figure out how to get everything in before the system shuts them out or whatever, and hit the send button without getting you know their stuff rejected. So yeah, yeah, and I think that. Um and I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit on Thursday in my talk, but culture change is kind of the hardest part about performance within an organization. Like, it's, you know, how many people would consider themselves a performance cop or a performance janitor in their organization? 
like certainly we exist and that's a burnout position, you know? So what can we do to, again, empower and educate those around us to be making these decisions to understand how their choices and their work impacts the end page load time and, and in total the end user experience, right? Because we're not just talking about page load time at this point, we're talking about battery life, we're talking about all these other things. And today, it's, there are a lot of examples about businesses that thrive on performance. I mean, Instagram success was often touted because of how snappy it is. Uh, I mean, definitely in the, in the world of Google and Facebook, you can tell those a lot of stats around it. But yeah, so expanding that out and making the entire organization feel like it's a, it's a, it's a success and it's a core need for them. Uh, there are many, many case studies in many of the uh, uh, past philosophies from Lonely Planet for various others. There's going to be more and more of those. Uh, just to help you spread that gospel within the org and broadly, not just to IT. Yeah. There's one in the back, yeah. yeah. This question is for Laura. Um, my understanding is Etsy is deploying over 50 times a day. How do you, uh, how do you protect against that? Rather than policing, how do you actually add it to your continuous delivery pipeline to correctly find these things? What tests are you running for? I'll say two things. One, you should come to my talk on Thursday because I talk about exactly this thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what Thursday morning, it's at 9.40. It's, uh, so, it's, keynote, right? yeah, it's, key, it's one of the keynotes, so you should all come. Although I know it's early. Um, maybe I'll bring donuts for you all if you come uh, to that talk. So uh, it's very difficult. And you're right. We, we do deploy more than 50 times a day. And um, that's why it's cool to have a dedicated performance team. I feel very fortunate to work at a place that has a dedicated performance team. Um, and we don't want to be cops, and we don't want to be janitors, and we don't want to be the hammer, right? Like, we want to um, help people understand how, how their continuous deploying of the site uh, can break it in a myriad of ways, not just performance. So for us, um, we do a couple of things. I'm going to get more into these on, on Thursday, but we have a, a toolbar that sits at the top of every page. When you're logged in as an Etsy employee, you see it, and we have performance timings that show up. So as you're developing, you can see exactly how much page, page load time it's taking. We also have defined SLAs, service level agreements, for the performance of the site. And we have a little notification that pops up if you are now breaking an SLA. Uh, we routinely do audits of pages, and we will uh, ticket suggested improvements and work with people for to define a performance budget or something else um, to help them, you know, improve their thing and to educate. It's like teach a person to fish, you know. So we do a lot to again educate and empower and kind of incentivize people to be doing the right thing. Come to the talk. <laughs> okay. I think it's actually well timed because I think we might be uh... just about running out of time. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're, uh, we're, we have one time time for one more question. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's lots of good questions. Um, so I'm interested in whether or not people are staying with the mobile web or opting for applications. Right. And, and it's an age old, you know, is everybody just installing? Like I, you know, personally just find it a scam to install a, yet another app, but hey, maybe that's what everybody's doing. Do you guys see any trends in that area? Or you know, is it still useful to be developing everything for the mobile web? Anybody want to touch that? I'm going to touch it. Um, so at Etsy, we have a mobile. Oh, we had a mobile web team uh, that disbanded once everybody became started on mobile web. Um, we also have an apps, uh, different groups of apps teams. And so for us, it's like an ongoing question, like... Um, how do we resource this, add, add resources to this stuff? How do we prioritize it in the project planning process? Um, how much can we do API first stuff that sort of supports everything? And so for us, it's less about like what are you, it, it's partly what, what are users doing on each of these different platforms, but I think it's, for Etsy, what works for us is going to work for us. And it's not, there's like, I would never say there's like a one size fits all for apps versus web. It's totally going to be user specific or, or audience specific. I, t I tend to just sort of extrapolate out like from just what we know now, which is that we know that more and more people are going to be smartphone only and currently are smartphone only people. And and we can correlate that to or, or you know tie that back to the fact that you know in this day and age how we use a desktop is I don't visit the same four sites and that's it every day or the same six or eight sites. Um, so on my desktop, I would, there's no way I would just could be content to have six apps, you know, and just oh that, that's how I use the internet. It's 1994 all over again, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so you know just AOL. Yeah. Anyways. Um, but so I, I, for me, I just think, I, I, you know, the, the, what makes sense to me, and maybe this is just me, is that, you know, people are, they're going, there's always going to be a use case for having apps for the, you know, very specific audiences, very specific sites, that sort of thing. But to kind of say it's an either either thing, I just feel like, you know, I'm always going to want to know that I can access the entire internet 
uh, through whatever browser I'm using, and I have and I have the ability to do that. Like to me, it's that's the World Wide Web. It's not here are my little apps. And it's an accessibility thing, right? Because yeah. not everybody's going to have an Android or an iOS phone. Mm -hmm. So, like for for me, uh, the web is the place where we can actually empower people, not just with the shiniest things. Mm -hmm. And that's why for me, it's such a focus instead of apps. There's five hundred thousand apps. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Um, so I think on the technological front, also there's a certain amount of blurring between those components. You know, Apple just now launched linking between apps, which used to be kind of a web domain. Uh, and at the same time, we have service worker coming in that should make uh, offline apps uh, uh, kind of alive again after the debacle of app cache. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so I think technologically, there might be ways to just, just from a, like the, the, the code being used, the delivery vehicle being used, uh, uh, those lines are blurring a little bit. Uh, but I do think fundamentally, um, and I'm borrowing this from Luke uh, Robolsky, who, who talked about when he talked about Polar, an app that, that he launched, uh, talked about how the web is better for discovery, for interaction. You float around, you, you find stuff on it, you click links from Twitter, but you get into this world of content uh, without planning or knowing which type of vertical or unit or box it would be around. And the app is better for uh, uh, kind of longer interaction uh, with the users. I kind of agree with that kind of fundamental assumption. If you're talking about, I think I would prefer on my phone, if I think I'm going to spend five or ten minutes uh, working on something on the phone, I tend to bias in favor of an app. I tend to prefer to write my email on a mail app, not on a mail page. Uh, sometimes it's reliability, sometimes it's performance, sometimes it's just sort of the fine-tuned environment uh, for that component. But I still you know, inevitably, even within those apps, jump back onto the web. And my connection to the world, the connection of the task that I'm doing to the world, discovering new content, linking different parts of that world of my mobile phone uh, is in those components. Um, I, I think tactically in organizations, I don't see any of them. Uh, you know, th those are, were my personal views, but when I talk to organizations, I mostly see what happens here in Etsy, which is both are still very much alive and well, both are fundamentally required, just like people are not saying I will shut down maybe my brick and mortar stores between, uh, in, in favor of the online if they have those and those are core part of the components or shut down my support line. They, they, they need both. Well, thank you all so much for doing this. We really appreciate coming.